put together this series of industry guests, and I'm very happy to introduce our very first guest, screenwriter Jeff Howard, whose credits include The Haunting of Hill House, Gerald's Game, and Oculus. Thanks so much, Jeff. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey, uh, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, my name is Jeff. I uh, have worked a lot in the past with the director, Mike Flanagan, um, Hill House, all of the things that you mentioned. Uh, we did those. Um, we finished another series called Midnight Mass that is on day four of shooting in Vancouver, which feels really weird to say, because how could anything be shooting? It's so strange, <laughs> but uh, they're the dangerous people there in, Brit in British Columbia. Um, so that is good. I also did another Netflix series I'm not allowed to talk about, unfortunately, but uh, they should be shooting in South Africa as soon as South Africa opens back up. And it's a big giant franchise name that you all know, but it's more of a fun, intimate take on it instead of uh, the big creepy thing. Uh, grew up in Baltimore, moved here when I, <clears throat> I waited until I sold a couple of scripts to move to LA because I was definitely afraid that I would move to LA. Uh, it would all run dry and I would be stuck in some weird city like failing and flailing around. So I waited until I sold my second script and then moved out here. Uh, I've been here, I don't man, I don't know. It might be like 16 years or something like that. So, uh, Yes, hating the Valley Heat at the moment. I'm hiding in a kitchen in Valley Village and hating life for the last few days. Um, but uh, working on some new different stuff too. I've mostly been known for horror, uh, which I do love and has been awesome to me. But I started selling my first thing. The first things I sold were comedies. And then I sold a biopic with Ron Howard and then uh, sort of fell into the horror thing with Flanagan for a while. And recently just been branching out to some, sold an action comedy to Screen Gems and... Um, just finished writing a movie with Alexander Aja. It was amazing. Um, he is a lot of fun and as cool as Flanagan uh, was to work with. So uh, that one's coming out from um, producer Steven Spielberg. Like uh, somehow, yeah, very strange, but it's like my second Spielberg job, which seems very creepy and weird. Does not seem real. So anyway, sorry, sorry to ramble. I've been talking on Zooms all day. <laughs> I mean, that's awesome. That's very exciting. There's a lot there. And I noticed a lot of that is kind of when you already have like the meat of your career. So I kind of want to just pull us back to like the beginning and kind of what made you want to be a writer in the first place? I just grew up loving movies. Um, I grew up during an era when TV sucked. So you can't really say that like, TV was cool at the time uh, for my Gen X-ness. But um, I just always loved movies. And, you know, my father just collected thousands of movies back when it was the VHS and the DVD conversion. And so... Uh, just grew up with just hundreds and hundreds of classics and always fell in love with them and uh, was completely positive that I'd sucked at everything else. Um, so I, I was a pastry chef for uh, six or seven years waiting, you know, while things were evolving and changing. Uh, so really enjoyed that, but uh, still have dreams and nightmares sometimes of making cookies uh, <laughs> in the middle of the night. But uh, basically, I was living in Baltimore, and I uh, made a connection with this guy who was the Maryland Film Commissioner. And I would send him my, you know, they're in charge of like bringing productions to your state. And I just knew that he had connections in LA. So I would show up at his office as often as he would have me and, you know, sit and talk and show him stuff and do notes and things based on notes that he would give me back on the stuff that I would show him that I'd written. And ultimately, he just hooked me up with five or six people to uh, come out for my first time and meet. And um, really those first five or six people sort of blossomed into more and more relationships. Um, my number one big advice is just, you know, work on relationships with people who are, you know, in, inside in their own capacity. Um, especially writers and directors are really well known for being open and receptive to helping other writers and directors get in. And everybody is so accessible through Twitter these days. It's like, uh, I, I just would not be afraid to use that. Like in the, in the earlier days of the internet, I tracked down a, my first manager online and a bunch of producers like Gail Ann Hurd and all these people uh, and would just start correspondences and relationships that ultimately blossomed into meetings and then became reading stuff and then started, you know, venturing into buying stuff. Um, but I sold my first script in 1999 and had my first movie made in 2011. So uh, it can take a while. Um, and it's really difficult to explain to like your parents or different or family friends, like what's going on. It's like, what are you doing? Oh, I'm selling screenplays. Oh, wow. What have you made? Well, they all die in the studio system. So like, that doesn't really happen. And they'd be like, why do they keep hiring you if they don't make them? Like, I, 
I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know either. Um, but st starting is everybody, everybody worries about agents and managers and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it sounds really like a cop out to say it, but the actual truth is managers and agents will appear as though by magic uh, right when there's a deal to be made. And that it's kind of your job and your position to get yourself into a spot where somebody is interested in something and there's a little traction there and that's what will spark the agents and managers to pay attention. So most, for the most part, some people do it without any of that, but really the best way to do that is uh, development executives, assistants to producers, um, the lower level producers themselves, the people you see on movies as executive producers and on TV shows and like the non-writing producing credits. Um, they are all in, they all have connections, they're all looking for their next project and sometimes they're really approachable. Um, I would never take the approach of saying, hi, will you get my script bought or will you buy my script or will you read my script or will you do this or that? But I would approach with the way of saying, hi, I am a student uh, looking to break my way into this and I would love to just pick your brain about all the ways that you did it. Um, if you get, working Hollywood people talking about themselves, they'll go on forever, as I just proved with that like 19 minute monologue. So. But that was great, there's so much information there. So I'm gonna ask a few questions that came up from that. It sounds like you weren't in a quote unquote industry hub, like a New York or an LA, and you got your start and you stayed there for a bit, so that is possible. And I, I'm wondering if with COVID now, that's even more possible. So I'd love if you would talk a little bit about more about that and how you just leveraged your network and how maybe we can do that too. It was exactly that. It was uh, <clears throat> just achieving a critical mass of getting to know people and approaching people as a fan and asking them for information. And what I found out was if I approached people as a fan looking to break in rather than saying, hey, I've got this action comedy that you would be great for, um, they, would, they would email back and forth with you or talk back and forth with you and eventually get on the phone, but they would also uh, slowly get invested. In, in a way that you could turn somebody off by just overtly walking in and say, could you do this for me? By getting them slowly invested in you and your story and your little journey, they then start to offer the help that you had been looking for all along. So a slow burn on those relationships in a friendly way is a really good way to do it. Because, you know, it, we're all the same. Once you get emotionally involved and start to like somebody, you're like, oh, God, what can I do to help? You know, That's um, great. And you are so, so helpful. We really appreciate you. I, I have to ask, so you said that you sold your first script and then three years later it got made. So were you a pastry chef in those three years? It was actually 11 years between the time I sold my first script and the time the first one got oh, made. Oh, wow. Uh, I sold five scripts during that time. Um, I moved here. I had always been a really good pastry chef, but I had never studied or anything. And I was like, once I was here, I was like, okay, well, I better supplement myself in some ways between these things and something. So I... Uh, yeah, <laughs> I did that for a long time. Look, I, I, um, in the industry, there is a weird knee-jerk reaction that a lot of people have, no matter who they are, that what they meet you as the first time they get to know you is what you will be locked in forever in their head. So if you're Jimmy Friend's assistant, then in their minds, even when you're winning a Golden Globe, you'll be like, oh, hey, that's, the, that's the Jimmy's assistant, how cool. But if they meet you for the first time and they only ever think of you as a writer, you know, so that's why I stayed out of town and also uh, stayed out of the industry for a day job. When day jobs were necessary, a lot of people go, like, if I was going to be a producer or something like that, I would, first I would have gone after a, a day job in the system and learned it and met all the people. But as a writer, I felt like I would keep myself out of the system and work my way in just through material and let them know me that way so that I never had anything else to live down. I've seen it with so many people where your friends who succeed at the same time as you are the least likely people to help you get anything done. In 21 years of selling scripts, I've sold one thing with a close friend uh, and had many, many things just go terribly awry because they can't stop thinking of you as that person from the bar or that person from, you know, and it's like when it really comes down to it and walking into their boss and making the commitment that it takes to say, let's go, let's go acquire something or let's go after something. They can't look their boss in the eye and say, I know this person is a dead on professional who will kick ass no matter what, you know, they, they they just remember the version of you that was hanging out with them and stuff like that. So uh, a lot of times strangers are the best. Um, they get the most invested and, you know, you, you can start relationships that way. But when you do come here and move here or when you start, it'll be you and a whole group of people around your age and experience group. And whether you're here or not, you kind of get to know them. 
And as everybody rises together over the course of a number of years, you ultimately come to realize like, oh, everybody now has a value <laughs> like within the industry. Like I had a friend the other day who owns a reality company now and he was talking about something. He's like, wow, like we all have a foreign value in the index of, you know, like how you can raise money through, through foreign buyers and everything. It was like, wow, what a strange realization. Um, so stick with your tribe of people that all rise but also broach out and get to know those strangers because strangers sometimes will take a chance on you a lot quicker than somebody who knows you well. That's great advice. And I think that's actually the first time I've heard that. So that's awesome. Uh, I tell you, you know, nobody will tell you these. <laughs> like every, every, everybody has a different journey too. Don't ever forget. Like a lot of times people will come to you and they'll say, how did you get an agent? Or how did you sell your first thing? And most people's answer is, oh god i don't remember <laughs> it's like oh it's so complicated because it's a twisty turning path that no nobody ever finds the same way in exactly but uh everybody on their individual journey at some point somebody on the inside opens a door and and they walk through and you i've had people who thank you it's like the person who opens the door <clears throat> didn't make your career. You did by doing the work. <laughs> they just were a human being who held the door open behind them and, and helped you get through. So, you know, you don't owe them your firstborn child or anything, but <laughs> it is very nice of them to do so. I mean, speaking of, I think if it's okay that you mentioned, I know that you, you've spoken about your children before. I hope you're not uh, <laughs> having any deals that include that. I know you're pitching a lot and making all these new deals. <laughs> I still have one. I held on to one. The ruffle still getting it off. Um, no, our second, our second boy is going to be here in about a week and a half. So, uh, just, you know, terribly petrified. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, that's amazing. You usually are the one scaring people and now life is, is scaring you. I was like, uh, Hey, what about a heat wave, pa global pandemic, <laughs> brand new baby, can't have anybody come in to help you, can't go out. It's like, oh, okay. But if you made it, you know, like, and then a tiger breaks into the house. <laughs> what? Um. Stranger things have happened this yeah. month alone. <laughs> Probably since we've been talking, something really bizarre has happened. I'm going to bring you back a little because, you know, you're kind of a big fancy deal already. How did you learn to write? What were some resources that you use? How did you get started as a writer? Yeah. I, did, I did a couple of things, some of them alone and some of them with Flanagan that were really, uh, <clears throat> I, I read a bunch of the books, but I didn't fall in love with any of the books. They all seemed really weird and just like, every time I read one of those, I'm just like, yes, for you, yes, for you, <laughs> you know? Um, so I think everybody kind of develops their own system, but I think the real trick is there is a formula to entertainment and you learn that formula and then you apply it to your own things just in a vastly different way. But anyway, you asked something very specific, which I lost in that one. Was, sorry. <laughs> what was well, it? I was just wondering how you learn to write. Like, oh, how did you right. put the pen to paper or typewriter or laptop? I, the biggest, the best exercise I ever did for movies was I took a bunch of movies that I loved, like Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is my favorite movie of all time. And I put it on the TV and I would, I played the movie and would pause it like every five or 10 seconds and write what I assumed would be the screenplay of what was happening. And when you looked at all, if you take some of your favorite scenes ever in movies or some of the biggest, most influential things, and you type them out in script format yourself, and then you look at the page, what was on the page was just, you know, a, a fraction of the ultimate thing. It was like, oh my God, like, wow, everybody else brings so much to this, that it was a great learning experience. And then seeing people make your scripts, you're like, that lighting, person just saved this entire thing or the musician just completely completed everything that was just never clear before or these actors are talking about character motivation stuff that I had no clue about and yet apparently I can see now that it's all there it's like they, there's a depth that they all bring to it so it really is the super collaborative thing and you are providing a it's not a blueprint it's like a blueprint plus but it, it, it is in a sense a <clears throat> it's not a complete thing. It's a blueprint. Um, but I, the two biggest things that I think I did at the beginning were writing out scenes in final draft from movies and TV shows that I loved and analyzing them that way. And then the second thing was I, I, I did this study of the top 25 AFI lists and the top 25 grossing movies of all time and broke down all the structures of them sort of minute by minute and looking at them realized that they were almost all the same. Um, one day I did 
Tommy Boy and Schindler's List, which ostensibly could not be like more different movies and just discovered that even though they were 40 minutes, one was 40 minutes longer than the other one, they had the exact same structure. Um, <clears throat> and so just real quick, uh, I can send you this written out too, but just uh, something that's worked for a long time is to look at structure as four pieces instead of three. Um, it, it's just been super helpful. And it's like the first, the first quarter, the first quadrant to be really, you know, hey, but I'm gonna get, you know, to be fancy, is uh, exactly what you think of as act one. It's, you know, you set up the people, you set up the, the personal problems, and then at the end, and the world, and then at the end of that bit, a bigger world problem comes and intrudes on the lives, you know? And the, the second quadrant, the first half of the second act traditionally is like, I have a, I'm, a char I'm the character, I got a personal problem, I got a world problem, I'm so focused on the, the personal problem that's messing up my life that I, I screw up the world problem quite badly, you know? And then midpoint is the world problem intrudes and bleeds into my personal problem somehow, and now the two are united in my world. And the second half of the second act of the third quadrant is, I'm gonna forget about my personal problem now and put it aside and just focus on this world problem that is so vexing me. And in focusing on the world problem, as you get to the end of the second act, the end of the third quadrant, you're oh so close to solving it, but then there's a giant rug pull that pulls all of your progress out and you basically go back to square one at the end of the second act, the end of the third quadrant. But what you discover for the third act or the fourth quadrant is, having put aside your personal problem for that section of the movie or, the, or whatever, you have inadvertently solved most of it by putting it away and focusing on the world problem. And now having mostly solved your personal problem, you can start the world problem again from square one, attack it in the third act, and then come very close to fully winning in a bittersweet kind of way, you know? And it just turned out that like 50 of the movies that are most revered in, in our lifetimes all have exactly that same structure. And once you realize that, it became this idea of saying, okay, within that framework, now you, you, don't, you can never do the paint by numbers because those all suck, you know? But what you have to do is bring your originality and what you're interested in and your scenes and your fun stuff to that kind of framework. Uh, and that way, um, the people who read it, the first gatekeepers are the readers, <clears throat> they'll recognize subconsciously even, the formula that we've all got programmed into our heads from having watched these things our entire lives. So it's like, it sounds counterintuitive, but if you want to get freed to be super creative, one of the best things to do is learn how to closely adhere to a bunch of those rules and just set it up so that in your mind, when you're breaking out a story in your own mind, you're already following those things. You're just putting your own unique spin on them. And you bear, Billy Wilder had this great thing. It's like, you, you hide the medicine. It's like, you, you, you hide the medicine of how your plot works really deep down under character moments. Uh, and then you can, people won't notice uh, that they're being manipulated and tugged along these markers of story. <laughs> so, um, you know, like the way that, if you ever go back a third or a fourth time to see a movie over and over in a theater, that third or fourth time is so different from the first one. And you look at it and you go, huh, this thing's like 15 pieces that just really went through this thing where the first time I watched it, it created this illusion of this giant world that went from zero to a hundred and filled in, you know, filled in everything. It's like, ah, this was like 12 to 16 chunks of stuff, <laughs> you know? Um, it just makes it more approachable. And it, it, it turned out for me at least that doing it in four pieces instead of three acts you do that three act thing, you get into this long second act and you feel lost and in the woods and it's where so many movies begin to suck anyway. Breaking it down into smaller component parts just made it a lot easier. It's like, you know, first act, end of first act moment that, you know, brings the world problem in. First half of the second act, midpoint combines world problem and personal problem. Second half of the second act, oh God, it's all world problem. I'm going for it, I'm going for it. Oh shit, I totally lost everything, I was screwed. But hey, I'm a better person and now I'm gonna win. You're my poor two-year-old crying in the other room. So, like, you just your first instinct is: is it injury or just pissed off that he had to come inside? <laughs> you know. Sorry, um, but anyway, those were just a couple of really helpful exercises that got me sort of kickstarted. Um, one, uh, two other things, really quick. So sorry, I'd rather do questions because I know. Questions Don't apologize, are please. <laughs> um, a really bright friend of mine said to me one time: this guy Stephen David, who has produced some really good unscripted TV. But one time really early on, he said to me um, this thing that he had realized, which was 
most characters are only on one of two journeys. They're either learning to care or they're gaining confidence. And it's like, when you look at almost every movie or every piece of entertainment, almost every character you can look at is either gaining confidence or learning to care. <laughs> and so it's like, just remember that as you're breaking your stuff down. If you don't have somebody who is either gaining confidence or learning to care, you might not be working in fiction, <laughs> you know? Um, anyway. Uh, Good to go. Yes. And, uh, I mean, that's and, amazing. You kind of just gave us an awesome little masterclass right there. It, you look it, it's really achievable um i like working with la natives here uh because um they don't grow up romanticizing the system and the whole idea of entertainment the way all of us who move from somewhere else and come here do to them like i grew up outside of dc if i had gone into politics it would have just been punching the clock of my local industry you know um, here, it's like when they, when they grow up and move into the industry, they don't think of it as the dream factory. They think of it as, I'm going to go after this position that I like and try to find a little place to work my way into a job where I can do the stuff that I like to do. And uh, it's very freeing to do it that way. You, you put a lot of pressure on yourself if you think, I'm moving to achieve the dreams of my lifetime. If it's more like, I'm going out there for a series of extensive job interviews that may take several years to achieve, uh, you know, your, your psyche might be a little better off. Maybe on a, a lighter note, <laughs> I'm going to bring <laughs> you back because you mentioned something. And I know before we turned the cameras on, we said there would be no trick questions, but this might be your trick question. Nice. So you mentioned learning the standard structure and then giving it your little spin. Do you have any insight on how to do that? And how do you know when you're doing that and you're not veering too far off the beaten path? There are many living examples of doing it. Like we all, we've all watched horror movies. Uh, we've all watched all kinds of movies, but we've all watched a horror movie at some point and we've seen the way it worked, right? Then look at what Kevin Williamson did when he wrote Scream. You know, like sometimes to understand what makes them tick, you need to look at the revealing behind the scenes versions of the, the deconstructive versions of the movies themselves. And they tell us all those moments and those little tent poles that you're supposed to hit while they're mocking them. You know what I mean? It's like, it's what the Wayans Brothers movies are so good for. It's like, whatever genre they decide to do for their spoofs of the moment, they're also teaching you the structure of that. Like animated stuff is the best in the world at teaching. Every editor you'll ever meet is like, I learned how to cut from cartoons because, car, you know, it, it takes you out of the reality to the point that you can understand what the cutting is. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Is that, I don't know if that's an answer, but like the, the deconstruct it in your mind and tell yourself the generic nonsense version that I wouldn't necessarily watch of the standard genre thing that I'm trying to do contains all these beats and then put those beats down and then do them in a just in your own twisted personalized way with your own experiences and your own voice. But if you hit those beats, the readers and the producers and, and eventually the audience subconsciously knows them from the thousands and thousands of pieces of entertainment we've seen. And that you ever watch a movie and you're like, this is weird. Like what's, you know, like, so like, a, and look, obviously all of this advice falls within the bell curve of life. Like most of things are here. There's definitely outliers on both sides. And most of the outliers are the things that we really think about and love. But most of the stuff that gets made are the things that fall into the middle of the bell curve. Um, so a lot of my advice tends to be toward the middle of the bell curve because the outliers with an individual, fantastic, awesome voice are going to be fine. <laughs> you know, they're going to demonstrate that voice eventually to somebody who will get it and they will do something offbeat and do it. But for the rest of us who are sort of mainstreamish in our own way, it's good to learn the rules and then twist them. Um, it's what, I, I am not a sports person at all, but I had a sports cousin one time who told me he was like a baseball dude. And his whole <laughs> thing was like, every great baseball hitter that you ever know does it all wrong, but they do it all wrong based on their own perversion of the basic rules. And I think that's what we have to remember. Here's this basic way that structure has worked since silent Buster Keaton invented it. And here's how we're going to do it today with our own voice and our own rules. So while we're still on structure, one of our students, Patrick Diaz, had a question about how you specifically approach scene structure, so an individual scene, and also character dynamics. So if you can give us a little insight on your secret sauce. 
Uh, there's a lot of cliches about the scene. The biggest cliche you will hear about scenes is start as late as possible and get out as soon as possible. And you know, like 99% of the time, that's totally true. Would you never want to, when you're first starting out, you treat every cell in the human body like it's the human body. You treat every scene like it has a three act structure of its own and a beginning, middle and an end. And ultimately what you realize is there was this writer, George S. Kaufman from the 1920s and 30s. And he had this piece of advice that was like, when I finish something, I go through and read it and I remove every unnecessary word from what's going on. And it's like when you do that and you strip it down to just the barest of what it needs to be, it often works way better than your flowery, you know, um, laying stuff on the page too. Um, remember, you are, your prime, yes, your audience is the people at home and the people at a theater, hopefully again someday and all that kind of stuff. But your very first audience are the readers who you're gonna have to go through like 27 levels of to get somewhere. And so think about those readers when you're putting your stuff on the page. Don't have a giant block of text like this that is like a giant black blob of ink in the middle of the page. No one will ever read it. You aren't reading it. Like you, you are not reading that when you go back through and revise your stuff. You always try to do this thing to lay out pages where it's like two or three lines and then it propels you forward to read the next paragraph. Like, you know, leaves you almost on a cliffhanger of a, of a thing, dash, dash, and then boom, the answer, two lines, dash, dash, and just can't you be, be aware that there's somebody reading this who has 12 more of them to read tonight and is underpaid and can't even enjoy the perk of going out to like go to restaurants like on the company anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, but they, and they're gonna, they're gonna read 10 for sure, but there's no guarantee they're gonna read 50 unless you get them turning the pages. So don't be too thick on the page, tug them along and, and, and try to live with it in the read that you would do, no matter how good or important you think it is, you know? Um, yeah, the, the layout on the page turns out to be quite important. Um, and try, man, I almost said a name, but there's a writer, there's a super famous writer who every voice they ever do just sounds the exact same. And it drives me insane because they're one of the most acclaimed people to ever live. And yes, yeah, Aaron Sorkin's awesome, but everybody talks the same way. It's like, I just trying to do this thing where everybody has a very distinctive voice that tugs you along because it's very hard for readers of these scripts to remember the seven character names that you have going on. But if there's a person who refers to themselves in third person all the time, and a person who always has a sort of a little windy things mumbled down and kind of thing, and like, if everybody has a distinctive kind of voice, you'll get the feeling of who everybody is, you know? And, and so it's like, be, be aware that your very first audience is readers. And if you can't tug the reader along, you're never gonna get to the point where you can shoot it and prove how awesome it is, you know? Um, I always try to go with this philosophy. It's not fun, but um, it's like th there, there is an industry. You can do it now outside the industry, like phones now, or you can shoot a movie on your phone. And it's like, there's no excuse not to have your stuff. But if you're gonna play within the system, there is a system they have. Um, it seems unfair and weird from the outside. And it seems unfair and weird from the inside until you realize everybody in that system has a job and a boss and a thing to report to and a state a mission of what their company is about and what the studio wants and what the financiers want and so when you come to them with something no matter how great you also have to remember they're doing their job and if they bring something great in outside the parameters of what they can get done through their bosses or their little network of people it does them no good, stymies their career, and gets them fired after a few of those. If you could bring in something. But the, so if, they, if you hear no's from people, it's not necessarily them telling you, whoa, this sucked. What they're really trying to say is, I, I can't do this here. But then once you meet that person, you get to know them. I've had some of my best luck developing things with people. I've had some of my best luck with exactly the opposite of every rule that they tell you. Most people tell you, don't leave a leave behind. Don't, don't do free work and come up with a take on somebody's thing. Don't get involved in the bake-offs of a bunch of writers competing. If I hadn't done any of those things, I would probably be homeless. You know what I mean? It's like you have to, I, I think you need to break some of those rules and not be so afraid to take shots at stuff early on, especially. Um, if you're precious about your stuff or like a lot of first time writers are like, I'm so afraid to show it to somebody because they're gonna rip it off. Most likely, 
everybody, this is the way the zeitgeist exists, and Carl Jung explained, 19 people are having this idea anyway. So quite often, you're not being ripped off. Just If you did a story about a guy who robbed a bank and ran down the street and got shot in the leg, and you see a movie a year and a half later about that exact same scenario, that does not mean that you were just this originator of the guy who got shot in the leg running away. You know what I mean? It's like the Carl Jung proved a long time ago that the collective unconsciousness means that if you have an idea, you can guarantee that 27 different people are also having that idea. And of those 27 people, if somebody has a rung higher or above you in the industry, they're just going to be several steps ahead anyway, and it's going to feel like you got ripped off. <laughs> but you most likely did not. I mean, the murder right. hornet apocalypse movie is coming from a lot <laughs> of people. <laughs> Excuse me, I have to make a call. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I like thought you were actually going to like co-check on your, your child. <laughs> yeah, yes, let's go murder hornet. Um, <laughs> yeah, I wish it were that easy. I read this story, anyway, um, I read this story about Robert Altman one time, one of my least liked 70s directors, so I've just never been a fan of, but apparently he was on his way to, an air, to the airport one time and stopped off at Fox to barge in to Alan Ladd, the president of Fox, and pitch him something so he could sell it to finance his vacation that he was on his way to go take. And it was like, you know, <laughs> anyway, that's annoying. Um, <laughs> but be you, um, do find, be you within this structure, and you will find that the you voice is embraced much more than if you throw structure out the window and just be all you. Um, be original within the lines, at least for a while. If you become huge, you can ultimately change up. But if you ever notice, that's usually the phase in people's careers we enjoy when they get big enough to do whatever they want that we find them to be a little falling apart, <laughs> you know? Um, like, but you know how it's, like, it's often like there's a filmmaker you love and you're like, oh, their first movie was awesome, their second was awesome, their third one was awesome, their fourth one, they could do anything they want, they had a giant budget and you're like, oh my God, what a giant piece of shit. And it was because they did not have any of those filters on them that made them be original within the lines. Um, one of my favorite, just as a good example of it, one of my favorite writers from the old, Hollywood Billy Wilder's whole thing was they had a production code you couldn't have sex or cursing or nudity or any of these things but it forced you to become super innovative about how to do those things and so you'd have better ideas than a sex scene to show it so like one of the things he did in a movie was the maid came into the room the next morning and found a hairpin in the uh in the in the laundry and was like and as an audience you deduce they had sex the night before but you today they would just show it and you'd be done but it's like that's a kind of an innovative and fun moment that, would, that comes out of the restrictions that are placed on you. So be, be interesting within the restrictions that exist and you'll get pretty far. So that's a great lead into actually Patrick's second half of his question. And so he brought up episode six of The Haunting of Hill House with this wonder that you know, everyone was talking about. And he must have actually read the, the script because he said there was 18 pages with no cuts. And so yeah. he, he was asking, What's it like writing that? Did you know that was going to be the case when you started? Yeah, when the Hill House Room started, um, I felt like I was in a moderately good position because Flanagan and I had written a bunch of movies together. So when we started breaking down what the series was going to be, and it was clear that there was this one episode that was going to stand out and be really special, I immediately uh, glommed my way onto that one right away. So it was always going to be it was always gonna be a play in essence, you know? And so it was like what I did, Flanagan and I've worked in a bunch of different ways together. We've never worked the same way twice. Um, we were in a room with a bunch of amazing, that, that Hill House writer's room was a massive education and it was like a lineup of killers. It was just, I've still not, I've been in three rooms now and that was one where it was just like professional assassins all brought together who then also all believed in what was going on. It was. It was a really good lineup of really interesting people. And uh, when, when that one started getting broken down, I just immediately staked the claim as wanting to do it. And um, I love the emotional territory and a lot of that stuff, you know, was very familiar and real lifey. But uh, that was one where it was written totally like a play and they built the set to conform to what that script had to be. Um, so like if you went to the Hill House set, the mortuary and, and, and the, the house of the family was literally just modularly attached to the giant hallway at, at, at Hill House. And it made no sense in real world terms, but it allowed you to move through that thing and go from world to world uh, without having to cut in between. So that was a lot of fun. Um, 
but yeah, it was, that script is long. It's, a, it's, it's like 85 pages long or something like that because Flanagan, after the dialogue and the characters were written, Flanagan then went over the top of it and laid in every camera direction that would come out. Um, he and Michael Feminari, the DP, are just mad geniuses of working that stuff out. And there were so many times shooting, there is one, he's right, there's a 17 minute take. And uh, basically just really quick, they, the dolly that was moving through the entire thing was broken. And the actors did not know it. And they were only going to get one more. And three takes had gone completely wrong. And it was like a, you know, do, do they get told or do they not get told? And they did not get told. And they made it, you know, they, they made it through. And like 10 seconds after that take ended, the dolly fell apart and had to go away. And it would have been like a day and a half before they would have gotten another piece like that back. So it was like, uh, there, yeah, there was just a lot of, it, it, don't ever try it. <laughs> like when, when we did this Midnight Mass series afterwards, one of the writers came in and was like, I wrote a 17 minute sequence into this thing that's intended to be a wonder. And it was like, oh, do, do you hate him? Like, I thought you were a friend of Flanagan's. You must hate him because that was a very terrible time for him. The lighting of that, everything about that episode was just a giant theatrical production. And uh, it was separated from the other episodes. Um, it was its own couple of week block uh, for rehearsals and all that stuff. Um, those actors, they just, they just killed it. That was so, you know, it, it could have gone either, the, you know, that was not, that one wasn't, that wasn't the writing. There was so much execution in that, that it was great. Flanagan had made four, four or five movies before Hill House. And it feels like in a lot of ways, they were all sketches to get there, you know? So it was nice to sort of see that summit. My question for you is, uh, do you approach the writing for TV shows and features differently? And if so, what is the different uh, process that you do for each? Yeah, the biggest difference was a bunch of other people <laughs> who were all there. You know what I mean? Because, you know, the other way, you're at home. It doesn't matter what time of the day it is. The, the TV way, it was like... Uh, seven people are going to convene at 10 30 and you will be on then. <laughs> so um and it was a little nerve-wracking like um to to think you know because so much of it is emotional and everything so the idea was can i sit in a room with like six or seven other people and be as openly emotional and frank about everything as you really need to be and after like day two i realized like uh oh the, it, everybody who moved here from a different town we were that offbeat nerdy weird person at home and then you moved here and you're like, oh my God, every offbeat, nerdy, weird person from home moved to these places and now they're all here. So it was like finding this group of people that you were really tight with that you didn't know, you just didn't happen to know before. Um, but that really was the difference. But movies are a very personal, at home, on your own time, your own way kind of thing. And TV is a day job, um, but a very fun, <laughs> very rewarding day job. So... Um, and really, honestly, just in terms of career these days for survival for people, it, I would try as hard as possible to cover both. Um, I, if you can live in both worlds and be active in both worlds at the same time, you're going to be okay in a way that if you're just literally waiting for that next TV job to come down the line, you could eventually find yourself in some trouble, you know? So try to, try to dabble in both and always have one, one you know, if you're on a TV job, try to get a couple of movies simmering, you know? Um, it takes six, nine months to get those things going. And if you, if you can use the sustenance of a TV job to keep you going while you set those things up, you just plant the future money bombs that allow you to not have to go back and become a lawyer or a forest ranger, <laughs> you know? Um, it, it takes a long time for deals and stuff to get done. So the more you can set things up ahead of time. Uh, but TV's fun, way more rules and way more strict. Uh, whereas movies are just kind of like, you're just reinventing everything all the time. Um, TV is like, these are going to be 48 minutes and it's going to start a little boom, boom, you know? And it, 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 you have to follow along with that. Yeah, don't be afraid of the group of people. They're, they're all right. <laughs> so, um, and just go in leading with not being afraid of uh, opening up. The very first day of Hill House, Flanagan has heard all of my ghost stories. And we, he did this thing where he's like, let's all tell our ghost stories. And they're like, Howard, you start. Because he knows I have like 14 of them. So I tell all of my ghost stories. And then everybody around the table also goes, oh, yeah, I don't have any. Oh, I don't have any. Oh, yeah, I never saw, yeah, I never saw anything. Oh, I didn't do it. And Flanagan's like, oh, yeah, I don't even believe in ghosts. And it's like, 
All right, well, it was fun seeming sane for 14 minutes in this room, but uh, now, you know, move onward. Since you mentioned having done a biopic, and I know that's such a specific genre, if you could elaborate on your experience with that, doing research, how you were connected or not connected to the story. Um, yeah. Um, for a biopic today, the one thing I would be totally aware of is uh, biopics used to be the sweeping, this is my life, epic and now the real trend is like the moment you know like this the big moment and make that a movie and tell the story of the life through the one big moment so i just be aware of that they, they are all leaning that way these days um the one that i did was a book that i found um that i just got lucky enough to be able to pitch to ron howard and he was like yes we're going to do this and uh that was great and so i just i i had one just really one historical reference book to go through all the time. And really by the time it went through the system, uh, it was just unrecognizable to truth. And that was a really devastating thing. I, I, I did not like that at all. Um, it feels like the best way to do those is to find that real grain of truth and, and, and live in it and make that uh, like a universal entertaining experience, but not to just make up a bunch of crazy stuff to add to it because, you know, there was a perception that there wasn't enough there, you know? Um, so stick, I would just stick as closely to real as possible. It resonates differently for people when you watch it and you can tell that it was real as opposed to ours, which went from a very simple and straightforward hero's journey to like a massive Maximus, I'm gonna lead a tribe of headhunters against a Japanese base during World War II, bunch of nonsense, <laughs> you know? So um, yeah, stick to the truth. And having a personal connection to it is all the better because one of the things that happens with every meeting when you go in for a job is um, they say to you, why, why you in this material? You know, like what's, what, is, what is your connection to it and why are you the person to tell us this story? And uh, yeah, that's one of the great all-time answers. And sorry for the choppy noise if you're hearing something there. My wife is making, uh, you know, <laughs> this is like, <laughs> like making our two and a half year old dinner at like uh, eight and three quarters months pregnant. So. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. That's Thank a you. very <laughs> impressive cameo. <laughs> <laughs> so I just didn't want you to think that I was like, that it was like murder or something happening in the background. It's just the chopping of carrots. It comes down to the story too, because I don't think anybody could look at Malcolm X and argue that the sweeping version of that was great. But I think if that movie were made today, it would be about one aspect of his life. You know, it's just how times have changed. Um, but if yours lends itself to the other version, um, great, great can always win. <laughs> you know, like, even if it's out of vogue, Greg can always win. Um, so don't, don't be afraid to try something that doesn't seem to conf If you're looking at purely commercial survival, I want to get in, I want to survive instincts. You will often force yourself to take a great piece of material and do it in a way that it shouldn't be because you're chasing the sale. And maybe the real idea is if you're chasing a sale, Take your more commercial, more viable ask idea to that thing and preserve your awesome thing to do it just the way it needs to be. Um, and e you can get, you can break in with something that is non-conformist but awesome. Um, but you can increase your odds by doing something great within the line. So it's really a personal choice. I, I would recommend everybody do both, <laughs> you know? Um, don't, don't limit yourself and don't be that person who goes into things with one thing either. Usually what's going to happen in 99% of the meetings you'll ever end up in, 99% of the meetings that I end up in, no matter what, you go in with an agenda of something that you're trying to sell in your mind. And most of the time it doesn't work for the person that you're in that particular meeting with. But that's why you have your back pocket registry of things <laughs> that you can do. Because then you, when you start talking, they'll tell you what they're actually looking for. And if you hit it off on a personal level, you can then just develop something together that actually suits what they're looking to do. Um, so don't, don't ever not be true to yourself and don't crassly pursue something the way it's meant to be at that time, because it could also change in six months, <laughs> you know? So just the truer you are to you, the better off you'll be. But if you can do it within these limitations we're talking about, you might find that it works faster. Unless you're just Robert Rodriguez and you make the movie and everybody goes, damn. <laughs> you know, there's that version too. I just was very lucky because my person, like the stuff I like to sit down and watch is also the stuff that's moderately popular. Like I, 
I, I, very rarely will I dip into something just obscure and random for the sake of, you know, the art. It's like, I, I just often like the entertainment too. So I was lucky to have that sensibility. So you mentioned that you've been pitching like crazy. So I think that's a great tie in right there about, so you talked about right now, you gave this really great advice about what's in vogue at the moment. And perhaps you pitch what's in vogue and what's it like pitching over Zoom and what are some of your do and don'ts? How are you prepping for this? Yeah, Zoom is great. <laughs> I'm just I'm so tired of people picking on it because I live in like, you know, in the Valley. And if I had to go to Sony, it's like an hour to drive there, an hour for the meeting, an hour to drive back unless it's four o'clock and then it's an hour and a half. And it's now it's like, hey, it's 3.59. I'm going to hop on the Zoom and no matter what, I'm going to be home at 5.01. Um, so that's great. Like if Zoom TV rooms continued, I would just pack all of us up and move to the East Coast really quickly uh, because you could, continue, you know, it's like the one thing that keeps me here all the time is just that you can't do TV from other places and you really do need TV these days. And TV is kind of a lot of times where the best stuff is happening. Well, I heard you say that you can't pitch scares just like you can't pitch jokes. So can you elaborate yeah. on that? So like, how do you pitch a horror film? How would you Oh do yeah, that's what it was. It was the pitching thing. Um, everybody, everybody has a different pitching technique. The main thing you want to do is feel conversational and entertaining, you know? Um, I try to pretend that I just saw something I really loved and I'm trying to tell somebody I really like about it, you know? Because um, when you do that, you tell them all the flavor of it and all the feeling and some of the moments, but you don't tell them the giveaways and, the, and some of that stuff. So it's like, look, early on, you're not going to be pitching. You're going to have to write something, you know, it's like, you're not, nobody's going to go in and sell their first thing as a pitch, really. It, it's always going to turn down the written. But when it comes to pitching, eventually, make it a make it about the people stay to one thread so that you don't take people off in a bunch of ten you know there's not that dream sequence dit -dit 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 sound that you can use to tell people you're deviating it's just your one monotonous voice so you can't really like tell you know like they can't tell when you're doing deviation so try to follow one thread about the person or the people that it's about and try to make it as experiential as possible like these are the feelings they come across while dealing with these experiences way more than it's we open on them in the morning as the sunrise comes over and hits their eyeballs and they open it's like you're like i was very early on i pitched this director mark pellington who makes these really dark movies and i'm sitting in hugo's in west hollywood pitching him forever and he's this his father was a football player and he's this enormous man you know and i'm pitching this thing and I'm about 25 minutes into the pitch and I go, and that's the end of act one. And he goes, act one? <laughs> and I was like, oh no, I've totally learned a lesson. And I was like, I have way over talked this thing. It's like, you cannot do a one-to-one -one transition, you know? The best thing is to give them a big breezy eight to 10 minutes and then get talking afterwards. And in talking, you can fill in so many of your things. So talk about people, be concise, tell punchy moments, don't give away everything, but give away enough to know that you know where you're going. Tell them where they are structurally in the piece as you're going along every now and again so that they can maintain their check in yeah. and watch their relieved feeling when you go, and now at the end of the second act, and they go, oh my God, here we go. we're skidding into the ending. Um, yeah, so uh, don't, don't overthink it either. And be emotional about your pitch. Um, don't be afraid to, don't ever be afraid to be emotional in the thing. There's this great old Greek quote from the guy who supposedly invented structure who's like, if you don't cry, how can you expect them to cry? <laughs> you know, and it's like, if you're not really moved by what you're doing, your chances of moving or motivating anybody else about it are really slim. What would be your advice on how to like best effectively or like receive and utilize notes for rewrites if there's like any like times where you know you, you took a note but you're like I don't want to take that note or there are times where they gave you a note and you're like I'm actually glad that they gave me that note for a rewrite. Both. Notes, uh, look, notes that come with money are uh, irrefusable like when your uncle buys the dinner. Like you're going to go to the restaurant your uncle wants because he's buying. Um, so once they have bought it your ability to say no to notes is greatly reduced. Um, my biggest trick about them is the <laughs> Development people and the people who read the script are going to come back to you and they're going to say, I have this note and here's how to fix it. Forget their fix. They, they, 
they will never understand how it's going to affect 30 other threads. They're never going to understand all the stuff that gets undone by their sudden momentary fix that works in this one moment. But look at the spot where they were pulled out of the story to give that bad note and go back and look for it and scour and find out what knocked them out of this world at that particular moment. And then go back to them and pitch how to fix the actual problem. And don't say, oh, you didn't understand this because blah, blah, blah. Go, hey, I heard your note. I think this is the problem. And if I do this, I think we can fix it. Um, and that way, look, they, every, every you, there's a myth. Everybody gets notes. Everybody has to do them to a certain extent. And very few people can just flat out say no. Um, including some of the biggest people that you could picture. They just cannot say no, and they still have to go ask for the money to do it. You know, Spielberg had trouble raising the money for Lincoln. So therefore, we are all susceptible to notes, you know? Um, but so first off, identify what's wrong with the spot that they did. Second, you need to make, if you're gonna take something from your laptop to going to see it in the theater or watching it on TV, you need to convince like 117 people <laughs> along the way to do that. All of those people, obviously that's a gross exaggeration, but you know, like all of those people are going to have their thoughts and their notes. And if you want to achieve the finish line, you are either going to be a self-funded amazing genius, or you are going to learn to incorporate these thoughts and strip them in. Um, and notes are okay as long as they don't violate the principle of what you're doing. And if the note violates the principle of what you're doing, don't push back and say, you're wrong. Push back and say, um, here's my fear about that one and all the things that it would upset thematically. And how do we deal with it? Because I hear you, but how do we deal with it? You know? Um, yeah, but they are never going to go away. Uh, and the quicker you learn how to take them, absorb them, and put them into practical effect without messing up what you care about, the way better off you're going to be. Uh, but fighting them is going to harm you, <laughs> you know, uh, in very real, it is a job and it is, it is a bunch of money that's exchanging hands and there is a thing that they want to get back from it that they're going to go use to lure other people onto it. And they, once they pay you, want to get a version of what that they see. Um, so figure out how to make it work for you. It's really just another aspect of being original within the lines. Um, don't, don't let the notes ever defeat your, what you're doing, but make it a part of your little war campaign for what you're working on. You know, it's like, I will take on these other points of view and I will incorporate them because it's the only way to reach the finish line, but I'm never going to let it destroy what I've got here, <laughs> you know? So just be careful and be, be very politic. We've been learning a lot about the basics of story tr structure in general, focusing on dramedies and comedy. But what are some of the quirks that come with like horror writing or huh. fantasy action genre stuff? You know what? Uh, like, like, you know, like Dominique said, I, I don't think the horror and the comedy thing are all that different. You know what I mean? It's really, you're hitting the same nerve receptors, uh, you know, with that kind of stuff. And I think it must be the same way with drama too. You know, you're, the whole idea is that you're tweaking the nerves and the experiences that we've all had to manipulate us all back into that moment and feel it again, you know? Um, which is where I think that universality comes out of it. With horror, the best thing for me always seems to be to revert back to childhood and think about the simple, straightforward things that scared you to death when you were a child, like the lightning flash of the storm and the, t the t tinkly finger sounds of like the fingernails against the window that are really the tree outside blowing in the wind. And, you know, the distant car engine, you know, it's like the, you just, you have to put yourself into that spot of um, just like with comedy of just complete vulnerability to your emotions, you know, uh, and then push every button. And I, I just think you're, the weird thing about horror, which I realized is actually true maybe of all fiction is you create these people who you loved and then you, uh, you torture them endlessly in every terrible way that you possibly can and treat them in a way that you could never treat somebody you actually love in real life. And then in the end, they sort of like, grow, you know, grow from that journey. Um, but yeah, it, it is, it, it, horror, if they always say that writing thing is like, you kill your babies and you cut your things. It's like the horror thing is more like, 
you're a monster playing with your food before you eat it. <laughs> it's like, how, how much can I toy with this meal before I just, you know, crush it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but uh, honestly, all structures really are kind of the same. I mean, I don't think it's that different for a comedy or a dramedy, the, the twists and the turns that you have to have emotionally. It's just the tools that you use to hit them. Like, I, you know, I would hit them with somebody going, ah, and you would hit them with, like, you know, he's really your uncle. <laughs> you know, it's like, but it's the same, it's really all the same kind of feeling. Um, assault your audience and challenge them and don't ever let them get comfortable. Like, build their, uh, last thing about horror, but one of the things I love to do that kind of Flanagan taught me in horror is um, rope-a-dope your audience along for a while. Take 30 or 35 or 40 minutes to get really emotional and tug them into the people. And right at that moment that you get where you're like, I, uh, I'm deep into this story, the audience all of a sudden has a, a feeling about 35 minutes or 40 minutes in like, oh shit, this is a horror movie. This is all gonna go terribly wrong. Everything that I've just come to care about is gonna blow up in my face and go terribly wrong, you know? Um, I think that's every entertainment. Lure you in, make you care. Um, give you reasons to feel exactly like these people and then chop them off at the knees every single time until they get close to sort of winning. And I know you touched on this a little bit, um, talking about how your work with Mike Flanagan, but I would love to know too, like, how do you um, just continue to foster those great working relationships um, as you continue to work together, sometimes even for like long periods of time? Like, how do you keep that um, growing and in a great space? Can I also throw in, how did you meet? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, Flanagan and I were introduced by a mutual friend, uh, you know, who we definitely had not both had some romantic past with, for sure. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, look, this entire business is all about relationships, 100%, a thousand, all the time. Um, it takes a hundred people to make one of these things ha happen and everything. So you are, every room that you walk in, every Zoom that you click onto is just a new relationship to be made. Um, that's why it's just so important to just be you. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you just don't ever put on a performance in those things because win, lose, or draw, just stay as yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, because then you'll always be able to deliver that. If you go in and try to do some performance to make this person like you or become the friend blah 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 it never works so just uh, you know treat it like a first date in many ways uh, a very frank first date and just be very you and explore whether or not there is a relationship you to build um most of the people who come here are just looking to work with people they like on stuff they like and the thing everybody is most allergic to is getting stuck with a jerk or working on something you don't like so it's like Everybody feels each other out and, you know, and 99.97% of my experiences out here have been fantastic with people and relationships. Um, but if you're a writer, make relationships with directors and, and cling on to those bastards with everything you've got. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> the, the directors in, in features are critical, the way that showrunners are critical in TV. Um, so, you know, forge those relationships, take chances on people. When I met Flanagan, he was... Uh, a 20 year old guy with video versions of movies that he made with his friends in college. And, uh, you know, he didn't want anything to do with the studio system. And I was a few years older and it just started selling my first scripts to studios. And we were introduced by this mutual friend and he was like, I will never want anything to do with the studio system. And then we kept in touch and like three or four years later, he was like, about that studio system. <laughs> like, how does one, how does one go about that? And so we just sort of rebooted the journey. And the greatest thing I love about working with Flanagan now, because it seems like now you look at him and you go, there's a, at the, you know, there's a budding A-list director, if not already a pure, a pure A-list director, right? When we started working together 12 or 13 years ago or whatever, and I would go to my agents and managers and say, I want to work with this guy. They would tell me, are you crazy? You know, like, what are you doing? This is an unknown nobody with a short film that nobody's ever seen. Like, are you ridiculous? But I just knew that he was just really, really good as a director at what he did and that it was worth it. So I, when I started working with Flanagan, we, we went up against four years of absolute corporate indifference. And I ended up going back to pastry chefery because... 
I had to. And it was like, I, you know, but I knew deep down that the stuff we were doing was vastly better than the stuff I was doing alone that was making more money and dying in the studio system. So it was worth the investment to stick with it and ride it out, knowing that it just felt better. And, it, and um, so, yeah, work those relationships. Um, one big key piece of advice, if you have ever had a matchbook, uh, you can only strike so many matches off of the cover of any given matchbook before you wear out the little scratchy thing that ignites the match. So just beware. What makes a compelling personal problem for a story? Knowing it intimately. <laughs> I, I would take all of your hangups, insecurities, uh, bad things that have it, all those things, and live in those emotional territories that you know and have been personally fucked over upon, <laughs> you know, by life or whatever. You know, it's like those those journeys really resonate true. Um, you know, there, there's, you know, when I look at Oculus, what I see is my sister and I growing up. Um, living alone in the woods and really only having each other for you know like play companions and like how that relationship would be twisted and we did this movie before I wake that was just entirely it's on Netflix it was just entirely like that entire thing to me was the fact that my ex-wife and I at the time were totally struggling with IVF and constantly had embryos die and it was like that constant sense of loss and, and, and horribleness just informed this couple who had loss and terribleness and it was all the same emotions and you know um, you know like Ouija or some other stuff is external but when we did Hill House, everybody sat around and we went around a room and everybody talked about uh, stuff and it's all in there. So, you know, if you ever want to look for the worst and weirdest emotional moments for the seven people who wrote Hill House, just look at the episodes because that's what it is, <laughs> you know? Um, those kittens in episode two, I don't know if anybody, like there's this thing in episode two where these kittens die. And I forgot to tell my sister that it was in there. And that was pretty much the worst moment of her childhood. And I got the call one day like, um, hey, the most tragic thing that ever happened to me just floated by on TV, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, you just use your stuff, but remember to warn the people in your life that it's coming. Um, and look, if you're really good, you can, you know, you obviously it's not just your own personal experiences. You gotta three-dimensionalize them and add them. And one of the great things about it is you can take your own personal trauma and nonsense and uh, work it into these things where you can get it right this time because you're the master of the situation now. So, uh, you know, all the things that you didn't think of to say uh, when it was actually happening, uh, you, can, you can do now because you've had some more time to think about it. Um, but use yourself. You're the only thing that you really uh, know that well. I'm curious if you have advice on how to approach those questions that always get asked in meetings where it's like, how did you come up with this story? Why you, why now? Like, how do you talk about that without sounding like a complete robot? Um, but not trailing off on too many ideas. Yeah. yeah, I tell myself going into these meetings that unlike all of my other interpersonal communications, I'm going to be completely honest in this room. And just whatever they ask, I'm just gonna give the unfiltered truth and that's what it is, you know? Um, so if the answer is I don't know, I'll say I don't know, or if the answer is gonna think, you know what I mean? It's like, the, I would just keep it very human. Um, they do love, a great snap answer and somebody in a meeting will take a shitty snap answer over a I'll get back to you tomorrow really well thought out great answer um, so don't ever play the technique of you know what let me think about that go with your first instincts at the moment and fix it later <laughs> because they really do want to hear they're you know they're looking to know that they're gonna hand this over to somebody who's going to be able to make these decisions and tell them what it should be. They do, nobody ever wants to be in the position of, I'm going to guide you through this thing every step of the way and you'll be my little tool, you know? So um, just, you know, present yourself as somebody who knows what you're doing, even when deep down you know that it's completely untrue. <laughs> you know, it's fine. Because everybody is sort of doing the same juggling. There, there's not, like there are rules and there aren't rules, you know what I mean? So it's like, uh, don't don't feel like you got to follow some preset performance pattern of this is the person just be you and it, it won't work every time but the times that it works will be very authentic and much more real about getting things done then the worst thing to ever do is to be in a meeting and they go 
we got this story about a cheetah that breaks loose from the zoo and blah, blah, blah. And you're like, oh my God, I love that. I love cheetah stories. And when I was a kid, I used to dream about cheetahs and I draw cheetahs. <laughs> Unless it's true, it's just really lame. You know what I mean? So just, you know, say, like if cheetahs are not for you, don't be afraid to go, God, I think that's really cool. I I'm just, I'm probably not your cheetah girl. <laughs> but uh, yeah, sorry. No, I um, love that. Yeah, stick true to you, um, especially now. This is the, this might be the only moment in the history of entertainment where um, diversity, uniqueness, and, and honesty are appreciated and valued. You know what I mean? So I would, this is the best time in the world not to play the game in terms of material and deliver you. How do you keep, like, how do you keep the interest of a story that's very niche? Like in the example I want to use is Moonlight. Like no one expected Moonlight to win the Oscar, but it's such a right. niche story. And it's such a great story that it's like, well, why would they be interested in that? Someone who is not gay, someone who doesn't identify with anything in that movie. Yeah. But what we've all had are the insecurities of entering society as our own genuine self. And how do we present ourselves and how do we, discover our most authentic nature and how do we cautiously reveal that to the people in our lives as we're working through so i think it's it's, it's I, thank you for saying it and that's a great example of what i was trying to say it's like take that in that's something that is so unique and such a seems like such a specific thing and run it through that same filter of this structure and these experiences you know like paint within those lines this completely different experience and what you find out is almost almost no experience is unique and we're all sort of universally feeling so many of the same things. And it's like, I share nothing with the character in Moonlight on paper, but watching the movie could be completely affected by seeing this person at three different points in their life try to live as their own authentic self despite everybody telling them that you need to be something different or make you something different or your own inner fear to be that within your community. And it's like, you know, that, that, that germ of universality is why it works. Because even though not, most of us have, you know, like if you watch a Jack the Ripper movie, I've never been a Victorian prostitute. I have no reason to fear Jack the Ripper, but I do because this is like the way they, you know, the way they managed to lay this out. Like make the specific universal. Um, I always, look, I just always think of Meet the Parents, right? Meet the Parents is a very average studio movie from a very average studio time, but the reason it worked so well is because everybody, no matter who you are, is going to end up in some sort of relationship at some point and meet the parents. You know what I mean? It's like we've all been there and we all have our own version of it. So um, I, I, look, if you ever want to see a great antecedent of Moonlight, um, watch uh, La Catra Saint Coup, uh, 400 Blows, Tr uh, Francois Truffaut's first movie, which like Moonlight is just a great version of those same emotions and stuff, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a, a French kid at 12 in 1959 can have a very similar experience to, uh, you know, a, a black American kid in 2017, um, emotionally, even though the, all the events of our lives are completely different. So anyway, be that unique thing, bring your uniqueness to your story while telling it within that universal framework and, and you, you, you might, you know, so for our very last question, I have to give credit to Nicole. Please tell us one of your ghost stories. <laughs> oh man. Um, I, well, but, all right, I'll well, I'll tell you one that directly affected Oculus, if anybody's ever seen it, which is uh, my sister and I, with our parents, moved into a house um, when we were, I was in ninth grade and she was in seventh grade. And we uh, walked into the house the first time and it was all empty, you know, like they are. And we went into what was gonna be my parents' bedroom and there's a giant mirror on the wall, like left from the previous owners. And we both saw this woman in the mirror and we both did that thing where we looked from the mirror over to the spot where she must be standing. And like, there was just like absolutely nothing there. Plus, and, uh, but really the all time best one is uh, really quickly, I was in, ninth or 10th grade and I was recording the Beatles White Album onto a cassette to listen to in my mother's car the next day on the way to school and when I woke up in the morning and started playing it at the end of a while my guitar gently weeps as they're fading out you can clearly hear me talking and I say something like 
uh, look, they're coming. And then you hear this like English man's voice and, and, and English woman's voice. And they're like, Jeff. And, and you hear me go, huh? What? You know, like I'm asleep. And they say, uh, the, the guy goes, look. And, then, and I say, why? Look who, what? And he goes, and then both together they say, they're coming. <laughs> and then you just sort of like, and then it goes back to the uh, song. And it was just like totally unexplained. And I still, the tape is in my storage unit and I, you know, it still like exists. And it's like, I have zero explanation for how such a thing could exist. Uh, and everybody who listens to it thinks the same thing. Oh, you, oh, that's just faked. But it's like, I know that I fell asleep and woke up and you could just hear me clearly mumble talking to these things. So yeah, um, anyway. Yeah, that made for a crappy first day of work. <laughs> so, well, lucky for us, you live to tell all these stories. I don't think they're too scary. Um, I, I think that there's just a lot of energy in our world and that we're all, like Einstein said, just energy passing through different phases and, you know, whatever. So. <laughs> well, thank you so uh, much. Is there any last golden nugget you want to leave us with? Oh, God. I mean, look, this is, I mean, look, he's a totally debunked, terrible person now, but like in his early stand up, Woody Allen had this great line at the end where he's like, I'd like to leave you with a positive thought, but I can't. Would you settle for two negative thoughts? <laughs> uh, no, look, just, it's not impossible. Um, it, it really is a job and it's a muscle. And the more you use the muscle, the better it will get. Um, not a philosophy I've ever lived in my life, personally, like in any other terms other than mentally. But like, if you use those mental muscles over and over, you will get really good at it. Um, it's all, it sounds totally cliched, but rewriting is way more important than writing. Um, do I, I just really quick, I do a three page outline, I turn it into a 10 page outline, I turn that into a 20 page outline. The 20 page outline, if I was hit by a bus, anybody could find and write the script from, it's like everything that's in there, you know? So um, if I ever croak, contact my wife and she'll set like 12 of them on my laptop and she could distribute them evenly, you know, that's fine. Uh, but I, from that 20 page outline, I sit and never go into final draft software until you know what you want in all the moments. Not that you won't find great things along the way, but don't start yourself in final draft unaware of where it's all going or what you're doing because you'll stall out and you'll put a ton of energy into the first 10 pages and then crap out and you'll never, you know, you know what I mean? It's like, we've all done that where you just dive in and you write the first seven scenes and you're like, I have no idea what I'm gonna do now. Um, plan everything. These things are not by happenstance. Have a plan. It doesn't mean you can't deviate from the plan when you're there, but try to, you know, stick to the plan that made sense. If you write a really long outline and you sit down to do your work, it's like you have a friend there talking to you the whole time who is more level-headed than you and has an opinion. And so you can sort of like, you know, you have that second person there to reference. So, uh, don't be afraid of the page, but don't, don't put yourself down in the final draft software too early. Um, wait, wait until you really feel like you know where you're going. And, and just be yourself. Um, don't, don't try to, we all imitate and we all take in our influences and we all absorb them, but like do that, but process them and spit it back out as you. And the, the quicker you get to you, the better off you're gonna be out there. And just because, don't go into every room trying to win, go into every room trying to display you and your best stuff and you're shopping, it's just like shopping for uh, somebody you're gonna marry or somebody you're gonna live with long-term or something you're gonna do. You're shopping for somebody who gets you, gets what that stuff is, and then you can do a deep dive in together and make some things happen. But um, you're never gonna be in movies or TV alone. There, there's always gonna be people there who are invested like you are, um, just in a slightly different way. So uh, stay authentic, like color within the lines, but do it with your own voice. and seize this moment right now because um, they are looking for you like you're looking for them for really the first time, <laughs> you know? Um, so don't be afraid to knock on those doors and say, I am that, you know, I'm, I think I'm that voice that you're looking for. I'd love some help to, to figure out how to get in. Um, I hope that's a cat, Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> well, that room that I did for Netflix, the room assistant the entire time had a cat who would back up to the Zoom camera every day. <laughs> with tail and it was just like oh my god why what a disgusting image um anyway she's in, she's in a real butt phase i apologize <laughs> <laughs> it, it was just not like an image that you wanted to see in a close-up camera shot that that back view of uh, every time so and it was like a daily you know, so <laughs> here's the part of the day where the cats <laughs> <ate>. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> great. <laughs> um, anyway, just really, really, they are looking right now. And the saddest part of all is I know a million execs and producers and everybody, they don't know how to find you any more than you know how to hook up with them. Find out who the people at these, find out who the person who works under the person who runs your favorite per producer's company is and find them on Twitter. And when it's appropriate, make comments that are about things that you can relate to and know and be a part of. And eventually they'll probably notice and there might be some communication. And do enough of those and build, you can find those people. Um, not to say all the other things can work and they're all great and the co contests and, uh, you know, query letters and all that stuff, it will work. But the best thing is to make a personal connection and have somebody open a door. Uh, so give that a good shot. And social media has made it really easy. I took a long time to learn a lot of this stuff. I, I totally believe that human beings can't really fully take advice because we all have to go on our own journey. <laughs> so don't do that. But if anything, like, just incorporate what works for you. You know what I mean? Don't, nobody's ever going to do it anybody's other way. But incorporate what works for you out of it and listen to the little voice inside your head. Um, some meetings are going to be for you, some aren't. Some projects are going to be for you and some aren't. Um, just because you are poverty stricken at that moment does not mean that you should dive into something that isn't for you because you aren't going to be able to do your best work and it's going to hurt you getting where you have to be eventually. Um, find a way to sustain yourself within or without the business to take the pressure off of yourself while you get to the point where you'll do your best work. I sold my first script eight years after I graduated from college. Like if people could cut that down to three or four, I would love to see you all do it and, and like have more life. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your time so generously with us. Anytime. It was either this or cook dinner for them. So it was like, <laughs> I, tonight I will be selfish and do this. And that way I get out of cooking.